And I'm a big believer in the potential and promise of technology in not only solving all our problems, but really launching us into a fundamentally new way of how we are, how we operate, and how we live as human beings. So that's why the title of the talk is, uh, you know, finally called Humans 2.0. Now, something that uh, Dr. Orlean spoke about earlier is that white war, that turbulent war. We hear about conflicts all the time. Whenever you hear or listen to the news, you can only hear stories of doomsday scenarios, deaths, ravages, diseases. But I am of the opinion that that's just a false perception. If anything, we live in the best of times. And data supports that view. Humans today are the healthiest they've ever been. They live the longest they ever did. Poverty is at its lowest level, and so is child mortality. Democracies are more prevalent, and the knowledge that we have accumulated as a civilization is at its peak. Now tell me this is not the best of times that we're living in. And something that's going to be transforming us over the next decades, and has been doing so for aeons and ages, is the adoption of technology. Now, when we speak about technological progress, don't think in linear terms, because that's really what our human thought is used to. Technology moves and progresses in exponential terms. And to drive that point home, let's just look at almost 50 years ago. If you were a company that wanted to have a hard disk of five megabytes only, you needed to charter a Pan Am aircraft to move that disk from IBM factory all the way to your office, and it costs you $30,000 a month to lease. Now, fast forward a couple of decades, you can fit in terabytes of disk storage in the back of your pocket for the cost of a meal. This is the orders of magnitudes that we're talking about when you talk about technological progress. This small sand disk that can fit in the tip of your finger is millions of orders of magnitude better than why IBM created in the 1956. And this is, interestingly enough, by even IBM's co-founder, has been dubbed as the Moore's Law. What he noticed is, every year or so, the processing capabilities of our computers were almost doubling. So he said, or he opined, that this will continue over the next decade, that our computers will get better twice every year. And this has been holding steady since the 1960s. In fact, there is no better proof for that than something that's right in your pockets. Everyone here, here, I assume, has a smartphone. Now, that smartphone that you own is orders of magnitudes more advanced than the computer that landed the Apollo 11 on the surface of the moon. Now, just how advanced? It's 100 times, 1,000 times, more pro has more processing power, over a million times more memory, and over 7 million times more storage. Can you believe that that little piece of technology that you play Candy Crush on could land Apollo 11 a thousand times over, not only on the moon, but on Mars and further galaxies? This is the power of exponential growth. Now, there is a famous story that is summarized in this graph. There was a wise man that gained the favors of a king. And the king asked him, you can ask for anything you want. All the gold you want, all the land you want. And that wise man said, here is a board of chess. I want you to put a grain of rice on the first square. Then double it on the second square. Then double it again. So one grain of rice, two grains of rice, four grains of rice. And before you know it, by the time you reach the 64th square, that's more rice than there is ever in the entire world. And this is, again, the power to exponential growth. Technology, as you can see in this graph, after every 20 years becomes a million times better. A million times. We're not talking 10 times or 20 times. We're talking a million times over. And how many 20 years can you fit in a human lifespan? So what ends up happening is, in a couple of years or a couple of decades, we'll be surprised to be living in an environment, in a society, in a world that has been fundamentally changed by technology without really realizing that. 
where you expect to be in the next five years will be widely different than where you will end up being. And that's what we call the exponential surprise growth factor. And this can be scary at times for people who might not be involved in cutting edge research. What do you mean by a million times more advanced? What does that leave me as a human being, as a Momo, as an employee who's really just used to filing papers and maybe driving a car from A to B? And I think nothing is more scary for human beings today than the threat of automation. In fact, right here, right now, we are able to automate over 50% of all jobs and all industries with a technology that exists today. That means that half of you sitting in this forum could lose your job today for a machine that's going to be much better at it and much cheaper at it. Now, this is another doomsday scenario that a lot of technologists might want to you know, like scare you off with, but humans have always managed to adapt. I mean, we've been developing and progressing for thousands of years, every time faced with technology that was going to disrupt our industries, our lives. But here we are. We always seem to be relevant for some reason. And I think an interesting example to drive that like, point further is the American worker. Back in 1840, almost 70% of all American workforce was employed in agriculture. 70%. So if you told them that in a couple of decades, only 2% of you guys would be able to retain your jobs, what would you have had? Panic, chaos, millions of people thinking that they're going to be out of jobs, sitting on the streets, idle, with no other alternative. Did that happen? Of course it didn't. Because as agriculture became more mechanized, technology introduced new industries and new jobs that we haven't even thought about before. You didn't have to really tile the land with an axe. Instead, you could have been now laying irrigation pipes, driving tractors. Few industries introduced new jobs. You could have become a stockbroker or an influencer today. If you told an American farmer that you could be making money by shooting videos on a smartphone, they think you're crazy. But again, the American farmer was thinking in a linear way, not in an exponential way. And there is a beautiful story that really summarizes this doomsday scenario that we're all faced with or that we kind of are driven to believe in. It's the manure crisis of 1894. Now, this is a funny, funny story. Back in 1894, the biggest worry for people in London and in New York was the piling up of horse feces and horse manure in the streets because everyone was using horses and carriages to drive themselves around. We're talking today about climate change and the threats of climate change. Back then, they were thinking about the threat of horse manure. And there was a big title on the Times of London at that time that said, in 50 years, every street in London will be buried under nine feet of manure. Now, who would have thought that manure would give us so much wisdom? Because what happened in 50 years? We weren't drowning in feces because there was a new technology that changed the entire game, automobiles and cars. I mean, Ford, when they interviewed him once, he said, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said, we want faster horses. Because they wouldn't have thought what an automobile looked like. They didn't know what cars were until he showed it to them. And again, the moral of this few example is to really kind of encourage you to take a step back and not think in terms of tomorrow or next week, but think in terms of decades and how technology is exponentially changing and transforming how we live today. And industry, and technology, sorry, is not only transforming industries. We don't need to only talk about the future of banking, the future of education, or the future of mobility we need to start thinking more about the future of the human being because technology is becoming an integral part of who we are. And that has been going on for millennials. In fact, the first sign of that was a 3,000-year-old finger prosthesis that was found. 3,000-year-olds we have been augmenting the human body. Today, we have pacemakers that allow us to still survive even with feeble hearts. 
We have smartphones that are becoming an extension of who we are. I mean, how many times do you touch your phone or use your phone? Probably more than anything else that you do in your everyday life. So that means that really the phone is part of us. Some people get withdrawal symptoms whenever their phones are taken from them. Doesn't that make our phones part of our bodies? Doesn't that make technology part of who we are? And I think there is nothing more exciting in terms of what technology is augmenting us and changing us than genetics and genetic engineering. A decade ago, when the Bill Clinton, uh, Bill Clinton administration decided to sequence the first human genome, it took them 13 years to complete the sequencing, and it cost the US administration a billion dollars to sequence the entire human genome. Today, it takes two days and a couple hundred dollars to do the same. And as we get a deeper understanding of the building blocks of our genetic code or our software, as we get larger and larger data pools of genome databases from around the world, we are now able to pinpoint exactly what each gene is responsible for. Maybe the gene of happiness, as was mentioned earlier. Maybe what gene is responsible for higher IQ and better intelligence. What gene is responsible for the color of your hair and the color of your eyes. We are able to understand every single aspect of our humanity and how it ties back to a couple of letters in our DNA or our genome sequence. In fact, we have even gone beyond understanding what genes makes us who we are to now playing with that and editing it. We're playing gods. We're now able to take bacteria using commercially available technologies such as CRISPR to change what they were fundamentally built to do. We can make bacteria generate or produce insulin for human consumption. We are able to genetically engineer animals to create or to have organs that can be transplanted into a human being, so we don't need any more human transplants. We're changing life as it is today. Now think in terms of exponential growth, where that is taking us in a couple of decades. We're talking about completely wiping out cancers, genetic diseases and ailments, even the fundamentals of death, making us potentially immortal. And what does that mean? for having babies. I mean, today in IVF practices, you can actually start picking which baby you want by screening the embryos beforehand. Maybe you want a kid with blue eyes. Maybe you want a kid who has the same IQ as Einstein. Maybe you want a kid who's two meters tall. You'll be able to do that maybe from the comfort of an app. Now, we're headed to a future where we'll be able to have designer babies. Now again, if you can engineer human beings, make them the way we want, what does, mix? what does that make our humanity today? Is it something that is static, or is it something we can play with however we want? But I think however way you augment the human body or the human intellect, we are still no match the technologies today, such as artificial intelligence. I mean, you can't fit in all of Google or Wikipedia inside your brain, right? A computer can. You can't telepathically communicate with other people in the room at the speed of light. A computer can do that through the internet. So we are still no match to technology. And I think that only hits us, really, when we start looking at technology beating human beings at tasks that we thought we were supreme at. When we have an AI beating the world champion in chess, or an AI beating the world champion in Go, which are tasks that were unimaginably hard for a human being, because the um, scenarios or alternatives involved require trillions of processing capabilities that we only thought the human brain capable of. But we're losing that battle again every day. So some of you might have heard of the Google's project, AlphaGo, that beats the Go champion, right? That was not the most impressive thing that happened. What happened was after that, AI was built, and obviously it learned from human strategies and human games to be able to beat that champion. They developed a new algorithm or a new AI called AlphaGo Zero. And Zero stands for the fact that this AI was not given any data on the Go game. It didn't learn from human beings. It was just playing against itself using no data and no background 
until it was able to become better than the original AI. It was able to pack millions or thousands of years of human knowledge and practice in just a couple of hours. This is what's frightening about AI, the fact that you can combine our entire human civilizational history in a couple of hours and go beyond that exponentially. And that's bringing us closer and closer to a defining moment in humanity, and that's the singularity. Singularity, as defined, is the moment when AI will become more powerful than human intelligence. Now, we have two types of AI. Weak AI, which is a task-specific AI, a chatbot that can answer consumer, customer support questions, or an AI that can file our tax returns. But we don't have a gen what we call the artificial general intelligence or the strong AI yet, just an algorithm that can be better at everything. The same way you put a human brain to any task and we learned, we're not yet there in terms of AI, but we're fast approaching that point. And once that happens, again, the law of exponential growth will mean that we are going to be dwarfed by those algorithms. And we will look at ants or maybe chimpanzees compared to those sorts of algorithms. So where does that leave us? Is humanity doomed to just become an anecdote in history? Or will we be forced to merge with these AIs in order to still remain relevant? And that's really the moment where we leap into humanity 2.0 or transhumanism, where we're transcending our biological limitations to really make the most of the AI's ultra-fast processing power while retaining human cognitive intellect. And there are already companies that are doing work in this field notably Elon Musk's Neuralink, where we're trying to build brain-machine interfaces to enable us to merge with the internet. I mean, what's the problem with the human body so far? It's really the biological limitations of it. How many words can you type in a minute? How many words can you say in a minute? A couple. You can't say or process a trillion words a second like a computer can. So we need that fast processing power but we still need the values, the moral compass, the general guidance and wisdom of the human brain to guide that AI. And once we really re reach that point in 20 years, in 30 years, where we have merged with AI, a lot of the trivial questions, or not so trivial questions we are dealing with today, will become really irrelevant. We're afraid of climate change, but what is really the threat of climate change to a civilization running on green tech? What is the threat of overpopulation to a multi-planetary species? What is the threat of poverty to a civilization where AI produces abundant resources? We really need to go past our manure paradox, beyond our linear thinking, and start thinking exponentially. Because the human of the future, some of you in this audience will be able to live to a thousand years, and we'll be able to merge with AI. And our worry, we're not that we're going to be drowning under nine feet of manure. Thank you. <laughs>